Hi, Troy. Hi, Philip. How's it going? Good. How are you? I'm uh, doing well. Um, I'm uh, out here in Oregon, and uh, uh, it's spring here, and so um, every moment during a spring day, uh, the sun goes just from, the the sky goes from gray to gold, and just in an instant. Um, and uh, growing up in Southern California, it's just sun all day, and so I've never had these like literally moments of magic that happen every single day, where um, you're just you just get really happy. And um, uh, so one just happened, and uh, it was pretty great. Yeah, it's a spring is a beautiful thing. <laughs> yeah, spring spring is a beautiful thing, and both of us in uh, uh, in uh, college uh, just we didn't really ever experience spring. It was just a little hotter than we'd want, and then perfect. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let me, uh, let me introduce us. Um, and I am Philip Menchaca, project coordinator at Union Theological Seminary, and this is meaningoflife.tv. Uh, I'm joined by Dr. Troy Campbell, a professor at the University of Oregon, who studies, uh, well, one of the things he studies is how identity and beliefs uh, affect our behavior. Um, and for those of you who have had the uh, misfortune of listening to me on Meaning of Life in the past, I should note that today is a bit of a detour from what I normally talk about, which is religion and little-known religious traditions, uh, because today Troy and I are going to get scientific. Uh, yes. A few impressive things that I want to note about Troy first. Uh, you were listed on Pacific Standards 30 Under 30 list recently. And we're also recently awarded the Frank Research Prize in Public Interest Communications. Um, and one of the things we're going to talk about today, you had the most viewed press release in Duke University history. Is that correct? Um, yeah, most viewed um, research press release. I think the basketball team has, uh, has beat me a couple times. <laughs> ah, well, hard to compete with basketball. Um, and that press release concerned a, a study um, that you undertook uh, on a hypothesis that you call solution aversion. Uh, this is in the context of belief in climate science. Uh, so we'll start there, and then we'll get into some of your other research, including uh, how you've looked at the ways people use untestable beliefs to bolster their worldviews. Uh, so first of all, I was just hoping... Uh, climate science is a politically contentious thing. There's this divide between conservatives have higher levels of skepticism, liberals have lower levels of skepticism, um, and there are various theories to explain this. Um, and I was hoping you could just take us through a couple of these other theories, not solution aversion, um, that have been proposed to explain this partisan divide, and then we can talk about why your hypothesis is different. Yeah, so, um, so there's a lot of reasons, uh, straightforwardly, that people have different opinions on uh, the climate science and the existence of climate change and the severity of the problem. And, uh, you know, one of the big, huge pushes and that buzzword is climate change communication. How do we do it? How do we do it right? What is it that the communication should have in them that are going to lead people to um, uh, changing their beliefs um, and or behaviors? And so the short answer to it is there's a lot of things uh, that need to be done and can be changed. So one thing uh, that um, is proposed as a solution, and I'm, uh, I'm going to go through a couple of the ones that are, are not my research, but I, I think are very important to think about, is one is just the education hypothesis, is that people are not educated about the um, science, um, uh, they don't hear about climate change a lot, and that they, that they don't know that there is a near perfect consensus in the scientific community around the existence uh, of climate change and it being uh, at least largely in part due to uh, human uh, actions. Anthropogenic is the term. And um, so uh, that hypothesis is very true. And I think that one of the things that people often forget about is that you, as a person who's listening to uh, this uh, podcast or video, you probably hear about climate change all the time. It's, you actually might be annoyed about how much you hear about it on your Facebook feed or your Twitter. You're just like, we get it, we get it, we get it. Um, but they've done uh, quite a bit of research in finding that lots and lots of people actually hear about it once a month or less. And so there's a huge difference in what people are being educated about that issue. And that itself right there 
is an incredible um, barrier to uh, climate change communication. Uh, the second thing about the education hypothesis that is uh, not my own research, uh, but is an important thing to do, is the how of the education. So one of the things that they find in climate change education is if you just tell people statistics, it doesn't change their beliefs as much as you think the statistics should. Um, and uh, your hypothesis might be, well, you might have another reason. You're like, I guess scientific information doesn't work. Um, and what they find actually is that scientific information is much more effective when it's visual. So a graph of climate change science um, is much more persuasive in um, persuading somebody who is on the fence um, or actually potentially in a little bit of strong denial about uh, the climate change uh, conditions. And so they say a picture is worth a thousand words. It, it really is. Uh, pictures make us feel things that um, facts alone cannot. And uh, the right sort of graphical and visual and even narrative communications about climate change can be much more effective in making people uh, believe that climate change is a problem and also potentially drive them to care about solving the solution. Um, so that being said, uh, that is uh, something that occurs and some people have used it to explain the uh, climate change divide between Republicans and conservatives. And the idea being that Republicans... Or Republicans and... Oh, sorry, Republicans Democrats. and Democrats, or conservatives and liberals. Um, and uh, so the hypothesis there is that Republicans and Democrats are simply receiving different information about climate science. Mm -hmm. And if you look at any of the studies done by that, that is true. And I think that that is definitely one reason uh, why this exists. But we looked at a different reason, is that, uh, and this is where it gets much more politically contentious, mm -hmm. is that conservatives, we actually say, have more of a motivation to deny that climate change exists. Mm -hmm. And that is because uh, with climate change, the science itself is intertwined with the political narrative that the solution to climate change is restricting the free market and using government regulation. So pretty much whenever you think of climate change, this, the main solutions to it is something that is very, very anti-free market. And so they, and some studies done before us, they found that the more free market um, uh, favoring a Republican was, um, the more likely they would be to be um, against climate change. And, um, and we provided some uh, follow-up studies, that uh, mm -hmm. correlational designs that seem to support that. Um, but the thing that we did, which is what we wanted to empirically test if potentially this is part of it, that part of the reason we are seeing the divide is that the solutions to climate change are more aversive to um, conservatives. And so what we did some studies is on a concept we call solution aversion. The people deny problems because they are averse to the solution, not necessarily the problem. Because right? lots of people think that the denial of solution uh, of climate change must be because the problem itself is scary. Mm -hmm. And what we say is, no, the immediate solutions themselves, which have implications for the government policies you want and your identity and your most important cherished beliefs, um, are, are in the way. And so what we find is that when you take the exact same climate change science and you associate it with a government regulation solution, we see that there's a strong divide between Democrats who agree highly with climate change science and uh, Republicans, but that when we put a solution that is more free market friendly to it, um, uh, we see Republicans' belief in climate change uh, rise in the experiments. And so it's sort of a very controlled experimental way to show that the solutions associated with climate change are going to, and probably are, affecting people's beliefs uh, about the problems. And I like to say two caveats whenever I talk about this is one, Motivated bias, which is what we are looking at, especially in the form of solution aversion, is not unique to um, Republicans. Um, every, when mm -hmm. I do the long-form talks, I talk about how I've been solution averse my entire life, um, whether it comes to ideologies, whether it comes to me denying that I was uh, unhealthy as a child just because I wanted to drink a frappuccino. Um, and, and the other thing I, would, I also say is that, you know, I'm in a business school, and I personally... Um, uh, I am, am a fan of the free market in many, many situations. Um, and so when I'm making this critique, it's, it's not this sort of generalized critique on conservatives. It's just this is exactly what we'd expect with any group whatsoever, that if a situation violate, is, is in contradiction 
to what they um, want to do for a solution, especially when that solution has to do with things around their most cherished belief, this is what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and you did, you did test uh, a different scenario in which um, liberals were, were more kind of like the the target, yeah. a more liberal issue, which we'll get yeah, so to, we but yeah, um, and we did, and, and other other people have um, uh, have shown bias on the a part of liberal people, and we all know mm -hmm. that uh, you know one of the, my favorite things to do as a demonstration to people is to say, um, is everybody biased? And then and people will be like, yeah, everybody's biased. And then I say to you know I'm an academic, so most of the times talking to liberals, I'm like, are Republicans biased? People are like, yeah, of course Republicans are biased. Are liberals biased? And then they're like. No, right? Um, and so <laughs> no every, one wants to uh, critique their own tribe. Yeah, no one wants to critique their own tribe, and uh, that's a very unfortunate um, fact in, in most situations. Um, so and, can you uh, explain, uh, just give us a brief summary of how you tested this uh, agreement and disagreement with belief in climate change? And, and, yeah, and so, so I'm a, um, an experimental uh, scientist, um, and so uh, I'm to some degree what you might call a lab rat, is that um, my job as an academic is to do um, uh, experiments where we isolate variables very, very specifically. So in this uh, form of an experiment is we used uh, an online sample where we brought in Republicans and Democrats um, into, uh, we recruited them online, and they come into the survey and we say, today we're going to have you read about an issue. And what we had them do is we gave them the same exact, we'd say the issue is climate change, and they read about um, climate change, and they read about uh, what somebody has to say about the climate change science. Um, we had the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, Statistics on Climate Change, and we showed it to them. And then we also had some, we also gave them a little bit about what somebody said of what the solution to climate change was. And so we varied whether that was a government regulation, which was restricting uh, businesses from polluting, or whether it was something more free market friendly in which uh, the United States would engage in green technology, which would be uh, good for the economy. And, um, and then what we did is we asked them questions about their beliefs in climate change. Um, and these included uh, two variables that are um, similar, uh, but we asked uh, both of them for completeness. And one was we just said, do you uh, agree with this statistic um, that, the, uh, that the IPCC has put forward? And they entered their own opinion of how many degrees they thought the temperatures would rise. And then we asked them, how much do you think humankind is uh, causing climate change? And so we got an agreement with uh, a, scientist stati uh, a scientific statistic about um, how, how uh, much temperatures will rise. And then we also had a specific question of whether humans are involved in it. Because both of those two things are important to driving any uh, change on climate action. Because you do mm -hmm. see some people who will say, well, climate change exists, but it's not caused by like humans. humans. Yeah. Yeah. And that... And, uh, feeds into, well, how should we address it and can mm -hmm. we address it? Um, now this, this change in belief um, that you saw, uh, depending on what solution was presented to people, uh, I was wondering, and this may not be testable, um, you can give me your thoughts on that, but could this be a case of kind of enlightened self-interest where if the solution is more market friendly um, something that increases economic output, then skeptics would be more willing to profess belief to just kind of go along with it because they benefit mm -hmm. from that solution rather than fundamentally changing their beliefs. Yeah, so what you sort of have identified is uh, to some degree a weakness of all, um, uh, of most all psychology. And now mm -hmm. some people will say that neuroscience gets around this. I will be very mm -hmm. skeptical <laughs> of, of that. Um, I think neuroscience is great, and I think it does wonderful things. Um, I think it is not as perfect as people say it is. Mm -hmm. And just throwing it out there, again, not a vendetta against neuroscience, but um, as somebody who doesn't do neuroscience, I'm very, very disappointed um, by a thing that you would expect. But psychologically, if you just have somebody read an article and they say it's a neuroscience or a psychology article and it's the exact same conclusion, they think the neuroscience is more interesting. If they read an article and it has a picture of a brain, they think the article is more interesting even if the brain image is wrong and even if they're an expert on neuroscience themselves. Um, so um, so uh, just putting that out there, just because I like to uh, spread the gospel of neuroscience is not perfect yet. Um, well, I and guess that goes back to your point about images being an 
important way yeah, to communicate. Exactly. This. Yeah. Um, and neither are experimental methods. Um, so is it the case in uh, you know the data that we have and people who've done very, very similar studies to this, that people are saying what they actually believe or they're just saying something because they're like, well, if I say that, then it will allow us to do something uh, that I uh, want. Mm -hmm. And uh, my hypothesis that it would be is probably there's a little bit of mix um, in there. But it tends to be that people, uh, other research has found that when people state things publicly, for the most part, they end up believing those things. Um, that when we, we, we end up, when we are trying to deceive other people, um, we end up deceiving ourselves. Uh, there's some great uh, research on, the, on, how self on how other deception is really self-deception. Mm -hmm. And so there are cases where people aren't doing that. You can get on the like, psych uh, psychopathy scales and stuff like that. But for the most part, I think we are actually uh, detecting a real change um, in people's um, beliefs. Um, uh, verifying that um, I, and showing with 100% certainty whether that is correct um, uh, may be uh, a little bit um, uh, difficult and, um, and whatnot. But that's, that's where I stand. And I, I know, I, I think a lot of other people in my field might just be like, We're total, I'm totally true. Yes, that's 100%. I'm finding real belief. Here's a site from the 80s that shows it. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be open as that, you know, this is, we, science is, um, especially social science, all science, it's, it's imperfect. And yeah. I think that, that's a, that we need to treat it like that. And at the end of the day, um, I think what my research is, and um, I, I like saying, is that when you read my research, even if it's not perfect, um, even if we haven't gotten to all the conclusions, is you're a better person for having read it. Is that I offered that what I like to say with my research is really what I'm trying to do is give you action-ready research. Here's something that you can take and potentially change in your business, your marketing plan, your policy plan, your political plan, and potentially do something. Um, and I think that, you know, when the people read this, um, uh, people uh, will do that. And I think it will lead to um, better outcomes. Mm -hmm. So I, I do want to get your thoughts on how uh, communication uh, by policymakers and scientists can be improved. Uh, but let's first take a quick look at the study you did on gun control and solution aversion. Mm -hmm. um, and so this was a more presumably liberal issue um, mm -hmm. as opposed to climate science skepticism which is more conservative issue and you saw a, a, a the same solution aversion effect in both studies yes and so um, what we're what we saw in that study is that people who were um, pro gun control um, are likely to um, downplay certain levels of um, uh, violence um, in certain situations where they see that the solution to preventing violence might have been to have uh, a weapon in the home. Um, so if there are these situations and break-ins and people getting hurt um, and you point out the fact that if this person would have had a gun, um, then they would have been able to defend themselves. Um, uh, the people who are pro-gun control will actually say that those break-ins and those events are less common than they actually were. Mm -hmm. And so when the solution is not in line with what they would um, prefer, um, they're likely to reduce um, their belief in it. So they would um, say it's a solu solution in search of a problem because the solution doesn't uh, cohere with their belief in, in gun control. Yeah, so we don't, like, um, we don't like there being evidence out there that would suggest that we should do solutions that are against um, our desired way to do solutions and potentially those ones that really sort of hit at these things that we really, really care about. You know, mm -hmm. Gun control is not just something we want. Um, and I think that's a, the important thing about politics, and I think what we can get into it now, is that we, d we have political beliefs not just because we think those are the right solutions. They become who we are. And that is, that is a very, very interesting thing about um, how politics work, um, especially in modern times, is politics become an identity. They, as you said, they become a tribe. They become a team. And when we are on a team, it just changes everything. And so the idea is not just about being right anymore and finding the right policies to solutions. It's about continually being on the right side of the team, being better than others. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that is actually... Um, a very problematic thing. I actually think it actually, um, we don't, we're, we're potentially going to do research on this, um, but one of the things I think that's really problematic is that we want to be better than other people, and we actually derive, 
we don't just derive happiness out of we going to a protest and making something happen. We derive an enjoyment out of going to that protest and feeling better than the other people who aren't there. And it's actually important for you us. You mean like superior to the people that aren't there? Superior, yeah. yeah. And, um, and everybody wants to feel to some degree good, like a good dignified person who is above average, um, and um, at least. And um, so I think that one of these problems with these situations is sometimes um, uh, we need to be better than other people. And what, that actually is a real problem for communication. So um, I don't just, and if you look at what people post about, recent, post about articles on climate change, they don't post articles that are the ones that are good at winning over the people who don't agree with it. They post articles that derogate anybody who's not against it. Right? Because posting that article itself is so much more enjoyable than posting a nuanced thing that mm -hmm. would help win over the other side. And whenever anybody ever does post those things that are like, oh, people who are anti-vaxxers, let me explain to you. It's this preaching down to it, which is very affirming to you. And so um, oh, I, I, we, we have this term that we like to use around the, around the lab called choir speak. And choir speak is the type of language that you use with your choir. And it's affirming to who you are and that you guys are awesome and that the other team is, is, not, doing, uh, is not good. And the problem is in modern time, people, for whatever reasons, in part because I think they mistakenly think choir speak is, is effective and in part because they just love engaging in choir speak, mm -hmm. they, um, they post those things and they just, uh, just uh, offend the audiences, right? Yeah, uh, I think... Uh... I think you just accurately described the hellscape that is my Facebook news feed. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and they didn't even research on people that people aren't actually interested in changing other people's beliefs. Like, a, a good amount of people just say they enjoy arguing and trolling people online. Mm -hmm. And that's really problematic when you think about it, because if you would ask them, they would say this issue is important to them. But then when they engage with that issue, they don't engage in a way that actually helps that issue oftentimes. They engage in a way which, which scolds your finger. Mm -hmm. And so the thing about it is you can, you can use, this is sort of one of the things we're looking at doing research right now, is that you can use guilt very, very effectively. But you can only guilt people who are already in your choir, who are already aboard with your issue, right? Ah. If you go up to an environmentalist and tell them you're not living up to be an environmental, that environmentalist, um, you know, I'd be like, oh, no, that. I need, to, I need to be better. But if you go up to somebody who doesn't really on the environmental train and you tell them they're not doing environmental, you're just going to get backlash. Right. And There's nothing for them to feel guilty about because they don't believe that Exactly. They're not committed anyway. to... Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And, um, but it's so much more fun to post an article about these, um, about these things. And, um, you know, I, I love shows like The Daily Show. I love shows like Samantha V. Um, but, you know... <sighs> Those, those shows are choir speak. Those shows are just, here is everything wrong with everybody else. And, um, you know, if you look at the language that Samantha B uses on her shows, not just her explicit words, um, but just she calls the other side, the, the people that she sees against, she calls them, she calls them stupid all the time. Mm -hmm. And she calls them monkey faces. She makes fun of their appearances, like how much people make fun of how Ted Cruz looks. Um, uh, and she has used the C word against them. And if you just, if you look at that scape, you're like, that language is nothing. Anybody over there is not going to ever, ever going to want to be on your side because you have called them the worst possible things that you could think right. to call them. And, and there's, have, there's research on this that when people get, feel their beliefs or identity are attacked, what they do is they just double down. They double down. It. Yeah. And so that's, really not a very effective way of communicating. So how would you, do you have uh, ideas about how to better target messages uh, yeah, that so, cross so, ideological so here's divides? A, here's a phrase I like to use, and it's tell people they already are the people you want them to be. Tell people they already are the people you want them to be. And so um, I think that lots of times a lot of these social movements should be ran more like a business, right? So I'm in a business school, mm -hmm. um, and I think that lots of the ways that businesses are really, really good at marketing, right? So I love Disney. There's some Disney stuff up here. I used to work for Disney. Um, and, you know, Disney doesn't tell you, hey, you know what? You're an idiot for not thinking Disney is good. Come to Disneyland. 
right? That would not work. I would like to see that ad campaign, though. Yeah, I would love to see a parody. I'd love to actually see, like, College Humor do a parody where, like, they take, like, social activists. Not And, again, so many social activists are really good, and I'm going to talk about the difference between when we should be aggressive and when we should be not, hopefully, by the end of this. Uh-huh. Um, but I'd love to see, like, College Humor do exactly what you said. Like, here is if Disney were, like, a aggressive um, Mickey social- Mouse yelling at you, mm-hmm. shaking his finger, telling you to break up the big banks. Yeah. <laughs> Space Mountain is awesome. So much better than the cheap thrills of Six Flags. Um, and uh, and so um, you know what Disney does in the re- in uh, has this very very effective uh, campaign um, recently called Disney Side. And the idea was they were going to convince everybody that they were a Disney person, that they at least had a Disney side, and that going to the Disney parks was not just an awesome place, but was an expression of who you are. Mm-hmm. And so. That is sort of what I suggest that people do when possible. So there's a million different strategies, but the two strategies that I'll share, because we don't have a lot of time, is, or we don't have an infinite amount of time, is that one is that get people to be on board with your team. Show them that they're already on board with your team. You don't, the best way to get somebody to eat healthy isn't to explain to them all the ways that they're unhealthy. It's to point out all the things that they are doing healthy and to show them that they are healthy, right? So if I go to certain relatives in my family who are now having health problems, and I try to get them to eat healthier. I don't explain how the ways they're unhealthy. I say, well, you play basketball all the time. You know, you don't actually eat after 10 o'clock. Here's things that are already healthy about you. Same thing with an environmental campaign. You know, you already recycle. You are doing things. And I bet you see other people out there polluting in ways that you just find despicable, right? And they're like, yeah. And then you sell them on the additional environmental thing, right? Because they have to feel like they're in the choir before you put any guilt on them um, uh, whatsoever. You so can't... Use, using the health, the, the basketball example, for instance, so would the idea be you'd say something like, you're already playing basketball two times a week, why don't you play it three times a week or four times a week? Um, yeah. Or why don't you alternate that with a run and then you'll be even healthier? Is something that kind like of the that. idea? Yeah, that, that's the idea. And, and just saying, you know, you're already a person who's, you know, fairly healthy. Health obviously is very important to you because you do these things or you already look like a healthy person. So this is consistent. Mm-hmm. So people, people use who they are to determine what they should do in the future. Um, and they also like defending who they are. So there's both sort of this heuri- what's known as an identity heuristic and then also like an identity um, defense. And so never threaten anybody's identity. If you, well, not never. But uh, threatening people's identity is often not the way. And also you want to make them feel the, that that's their identity so they will behave consistently um, with that. And, um, and it's just, it, and, and the other thing is you can't make the bar too high, right? Um, so um, uh, one of my favorite things, so I, I have a lot of um, friends who are feminist scholars, and one of them likes to post articles like this, the 100 books you need to read to be a feminist. Do you know who the only person on that entire Facebook feed who's read the 100 books is? Her, yeah. right? And so, and, and what that says to somebody is they say, you know, I, I don't, that's not, I'm not, like, I can't do that. And so what I like to say is nobody likes to play a game that they are the worst player at, right. especially if that's a moral game. And if, if it's a, like, if you're bad at that game, you will just either not play it, and often you will say that game is stupid, right? Americans thought soccer was the dumbest thing in the world until the last five years when we got good at soccer, right? <sighs> Nothing about the game changed. Like, the offsides is still a ridiculous call. Like, it's still a ridiculous thing. The scoring is still low. All the things that they complained about didn't change. It's just that America got better at it, and so now Americans like soccer more. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and so, the same goes for these social causes. Yeah, so I think there's... I mean, intuitively, that, that does make sense. Um, so when should you get aggressive, though? So when you should get aggressive. So... Um, so I think there's also a way that you can be like, uh, you can be a combination of aggressive, but sort of make people feel that if the, that you will be accepted on their team or potentially all the things that what you've done before you would be forgiven for. So you can think of like alcohol, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous as a really, really good example of this is they like, you should stop drinking, you should stop drinking, and you should be proud of yourself once you stop drinking. Um, not, and, it, and this gets a little politically contentious, but you know, you should stop being racist and you should be ashamed that you've been racist your entire life, right? Um, that's probably not the most effective way with uh, a lot of people because, again, what it does is it says you're at the bottom of the game, and even if you change, 
uh, I'm not going to uh, like you. So l let me let me do get um, specific to some degree. So here's why being aggressive can be very effective. One, if you're aggressive, your message will often sometimes really get out there because people will talk about it. Even the people who are against you will talk about it. So awa if awareness is your problem, which by the way, most of the time on lots of these modern issues, it is not always the problem. Right. Um, uh, uh, awareness uh, gets out there. Um, uh, if we have time, I'll talk about a little bit why awareness is overrated. Um, and then the other thing about it is, is that when you're aggressive, it fires up the choir, right? So if people can be, if, if you are talking to your own group, being aggressive is the greatest thing ever, right? If I go to a punk rock concert and I don't know who's up there, bad religion, rise against, and they're like, everybody's really equal, we're maybe just a little better. No, I want to hear the songs that are like, F authority, we're going to crawl over you, standing on a rooftop, we're coming at you, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's the appropriate thing for um, that situation. And, and it's, it's, again, it gets back to marketing, right message, right place, right target. Um, and I think that, you know, there's not a lot of right messaging, right targets uh, that happened as much as we'd like. Now, that being said, I've seen, you've seen over the past 10 years, especially within the environmental movement, uh, an incredible uh, thing to do this, right? You know, they, sh they, they are more and more often showing rural people, the people who have often been against um, uh, environmentalism or less educated on the environmentalism, they highlight those people in, the, in campaigns. Um, instead of telling people about how bad the problem is, they remind people that the majority of people support things like public transportation and other environmental things when the statistics are there for them to use that. And so, I, 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 so as much as I criticize um, a lot of uh, sort of these the social movements and different activists uh, in the different things that they do, um, I think a lot of them are getting it right. And I think that there is sometimes where um, you, uh, where I, where somebody will come up to me and they'll they'll, they'll say, you know, this cause I, I just was I just saw this cause Troy and they did exactly what you said was wrong. And I would say, you know. They were talking to the right answer, or you know, they're at that stage in their in the time where they need to do it. And really, at the end of the day, it's really like you need to sit down and you just need to have a business meeting with your cause, and you need to say, "All right, who is? What is our goal? Who is the next person that we want to convince? Or are we trying to get a bill passed? Or are we trying to get everybody on board?" And you just really need to understand just who you are going at and what your next thing to do is. And the other thing that I like to say uh, oftentimes is that what you are trying to do is you're trying to get the person who's adjacent, right? You're, you know, lots of people say, well, you know, some of the things you're talking about, Troy, well, it's not going to convince the people who are really, really against it. But they're not say, your target group anyway. They're not your target. You're just going for the adjacent person, right? Disney is not trying, even Disney, the biggest entertainment company probably you know, arguably in modern times, they're not going for everybody. They know not everybody's going to show up to the next Marvel movie or everybody's going to show up even to the next Star Wars movie. They have certain audience targets and they go for those audience targets um, because they know that's how they build the brand and they build the social movement. And one thing that is really important with any social movement to remember is, again, sort of taking a business analogy, which is if you're growing, that's great because tomorrow you will wake up and the world will be just as bad as it is today. And your goal is just to make it a little bit better every day. There's not going to be this moment where everybody changes. And I, I look at my personal self and my own moral development, and I think back to who I was um, in college and a freshman and a sophomore and the things that I said. And I was just like, it took me a long time to grow up into somebody who's a little bit more nuanced and a little bit more educated. And that thing that I thought I was feminist about and was so proud of myself for doing, I was actually doing the opposite thing. I was mm -hmm. actually making, I was actually putting women in a box while I was praising them and actually hurting them. And I didn't realize that. And um, I was reinforcing masculinity in a way that was actually negative to myself. And I, it t takes a long time to move, um, uh, to move people around. Um, and it, things are slow. It's the saddest thing in the world, uh, but things are slow. There will be a moment where things ramp up, but just understanding things are slow. And uh, I'll finish this um, little monologue here with the example of the gay rights movement. The gay rights movement is one of sort of our most successful things of modern time in seeing a social movement. 
But that thing took forever, right? It, it, you arguably had like an acceleration of it in the last three years, but that was a very, very slow crime, climb. And even now, we know that while gay marriage gets passed at a Supreme Court level, that doesn't mean that everything is fixed, right? That, there, that still is on a rise, right? And um, it, it, so you're always fighting and you need to make sure that you have the goals. If you have the most appropriate goals, you can reach those targets. And it, it's the saddest thing ever to say, but dream big, but dream realistically. And that is how a business succeeds. That's how Disney is so successful now. Um, they have different products for different markets, and because they have different products, and Marvel appeals more to a certain dem certain demographic, and Disney princesses appeal to a certain demographic. They've all made people Disney people by having these different little things and these slow movements, and they've made them up this way. And to some degree, a social any social movement uh, can use that as a vague model um, for how they get at things. Mm -hmm. um, with the exception is that there is always a time to rage. There is always an appropriate time. Um, as I like to say, there is a time for the middle finger, but there's a time to put it away. And I think lots of times we have the middle finger out when we should be putting it away. And I think a lot of times we have the middle finger out when we don't realize we have the middle finger out because we don't realize how sensitive everybody else is. And we don't understand how the things that we are saying, which sound perfectly fine to us, are really offending other people's uh, sensitivities and stuff. And that's, if I. That's a really good point. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it's difficult. It's a really big challenge to understand other people's perspectives and especially if you are used to speaking to your choir um, exactly. you know your actions you may not be used to evaluating them as other people see them mm -hmm. um, so I mean it seems like the the takeaway here is that it is just it's possible to create messages that are effective and resonate. It's very possible. You've, we've seen it with Disney with a lot of different things, mm -hmm. but it's challenging and it requires a lot of thought about who you're trying to reach yeah. and what stage your message is in. Exactly. But there's the time to fire up the people who are already on your side or whether it's the time to grow your audience. You can use two different uh, kind of tactics for that. Mm -hmm. And I think to some degree that there's going to be different within any social movement, there's going to be subgroups. And I think each subgroup should, you know, respect the other subgroup. There's the subgroup that is the punk rocker and there's Coldplay, mm -hmm. right? And Coldplay is effective in changing the beliefs and making people more emotional or positively socially accepting of other people. And they're not as radical. Um, but they are reaching an audience in a way that all these punk bands who maybe have the explicit message that you want will never, aren't able to reach the audiences, right? You could even argue that like, you could argue that Disney has created some of these problems and reinforced stereotypes over time with their movies and stuff and potentially still do. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in, with the recent movies, Frozen, Zootopia, you know, you can criticize you know, the Frozen, you know, even though it has the sister thing and against the love thing, there's, there's this problem and this problem there with are, it. There are or Zootopia yeah. doesn't hit it as hard as it could. But you know what? People who were unaware of those things saw that in the hundreds of millions. And the people, and an explicit message in a punk rock song by Rise Against was heard by much, much fewer people. And each of those groups are important to the social movement at different, at, each of them are equally I mean, not equally important, but they're each important to the movement because they are accessing different audiences and moving the message. So this group is going from 99% correct to 100% correct. This group is going from 40% correct to 50% correct. And that's, that's, that's progress, and that's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, you do have to make a trade-off, it sounds like. Um, I guess we're always making trade-offs, though. And yeah. That's... that's... Yeah, and, and I think that, you know, one of the things that's really, that, that gets, gets really difficult with this is that, you know, when we get into these moral domains, we don't like making trade-offs, right? We right. know that. And that's really, really hard. And I think it's, it's probably hard for the people who, you know, are, listen to, you know, your podcast all the time, which is that, you know, these are moral issues. And, um, you know, when you talk about Disney and stuff, there's, there's not a lot of moral trade-offs that have yeah. to be made. And so what I always say to people in this is, I'm, I'm not telling you ever what to do. 
because I don't understand your issues as well. I don't understand your audiences. I, and I also don't, I'm not prescribing that this is what you should do. You may actually wake up and say, you know what, I understand every single thing that this marketing psychologist is saying. I know that what he is saying would be more effective, but I think that doing that would compromise my morals. And that even though it potentially would bring about a greater good, um, especially in the, the quick period, it's not what I think is morally correct. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just, I, what I like to say is I'm just giving, uh, I think what us psychologists like myself doing is I'm, I'm giving you a new weapon to think about in your armory. And you can take that weapon out and use it if you want, or you cannot. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's uh, maybe a good place to end. Um, so I want to thank you for talking. This has been really interesting. Um, it's really been a pleasure, Troy. Awesome. Thanks very much. Have a good one, Bill. You too.